Thank you very much, Laura, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining in today. Um, if you just give me one second. I needed my timekeeper. Um, great talks in the morning. I hope everybody's back from the break and um, in the next hour or so, myself and uh, Dr. Kavana will be talking about assessment of clinical outcome. Uh, just a few words about myself. I'm originally from Romania. I graduated med school there. Um, I worked uh, as an assistant professor in, in pathology in Cluj-Napoca in Romania, and then I moved into St. Kitts, um, where I, I finished uh, the, the preparation for the boards, and I became a board certified pathologist, and I'm currently serving as a division head in the pathology division. And um, I am a, an associate professor of anatomic pathology. And if I can make this work. And this is where I'm located right now. Uh, both me and uh, Dr. Cavano uh, are working at Ross University. This is part of our campus. And we are sometimes overseeing the Caribbean Sea when we're having a nice sunny day like this day that the picture was taken. So if anybody is visiting St. Kitts at any point, don't be shy, stop by, say hello. And if it's not COVID restricted, uh, you, you'll be able to get a tour of the campus as well. Why standardize? Uh, Dr. Newton presented this in the morning and uh, two weeks ago, and uh, he, he said it very, very well. Um, so standardized method of tumor evaluation and patient outcome assessment are really essential if we want to compare studies, if we want to evaluate prognostic utility of pathological parameters, and eventually identify uh, markers predictive of disease outcome in order to achieve better patient care. Uh, unfortunately, currently, there are some previous studies that have poorly described methods, and we are still citing them. Um, in this uh, hour, uh, in our presentation, we will be talking about the guideline. As Mike discussed before, uh, this all can be found on our website, vcgp.org. Uh, and um, the guideline that we are uh, talking about today is outcome assessment. You'll find other guidelines there. And guidelines are just documents that describe a method that is probably applicable across a number of different tumor types, and they can be used in multiple protocols maybe osteosarcomas, uh, visceral hemangiosarcomas, soft tissue sarcomas, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, although I'm presenting today, I have to say I have uh, absolutely no, no credit for uh, what I'm going to, I mean, no, no, um, really, I didn't do too much in, in preparing this uh, guideline, outcome assessment. These are the authors with uh, Dr. Milovanchev as the lead author there, and everybody that you see there, you can find all of this on our website, as I said. And uh, this is just to, to show you a little bit what was going through my mind when, when I was uh, trying to start thinking about this, uh, this talk. And uh, this also summarizes a little bit the idea behind all of this standardization, all of these keywords that you will see there. We'll be talking about a few of them today and some other panelists did talk about some of them. So outcome assessment. Um, from the beginning, it, it aims to determine the utility of tumor classification and uh, grading systems um, and studies that are providing clinical validation of pro, uh, proposed prognostic or predictive uh, markers must adhere to highest standards, must be reproducible. I will probably repeat myself quite a few times today, and Dr. Newton said it also several times, any parameter assessed with no outcomes has very little value. Um, this is, is not something new, and uh, most of this guideline is based on two publications. So one of them is this one from 2011, and um, it's a consensus statement on the conduct and reporting of prognostic studies in veterinary oncology. It was written by a large group of authors, veterinary pathologists, oncologists, clinicians, surgical oncologists, and it presented some recommendations based on the current state of knowledge in the field. Uh, it will. It needs re-evaluation and re revision, and that's why we are picking it up at this point and hope to continue uh, this initiative. And these are a few key elements needed for a prognostic study. Dr. Kavana will be talking about a few of them. I will be touching on some of them. 
prognostic study objectives have to be clearly defined. Um, hypothesis has to be testable. Study population, sample size, outcome, statistical analysis, methods of prognosis, conclusions, etc. The other um, consensus paper that I was talking about came from, from this group, from Veterinary Cooperative Oncology Group, and they prepared the document um, to establish a framework for standardizing of procedures for response assessment in canine solid tumors. Uh, and they came out with, with a, a resist uh, for dogs. What is resist? First time I, I saw it, I was like, I have no idea. So I had to look, which brings me back to our website. There is a nice, um, paper that describes all of this terminology that some of us may be not very familiar with. And it's great that it's there, like Dr. Milovanchev uh, illustrated before, the different terminology from, for the different type of, um, of uh, surgical interventions uh, is very important for us so that uh, we can all uh, provide better results. So RACIST is Response Evaluation Criteria in Solid tumors and um, it was initial in, in people and that was the framework for the canine resist. It's a standard procedure for response assessment in canine solid tumors. It should be easy to use, repeatable and applicable across a variety of clinical trial structures. This guideline is not perfect by all means and we, it will probably never be perfect. Um, and um, this is because tumors have their own way of, of uh, behaving. They have different, different uh, behavior, uh, depending on the type of tumor, depending on the animal, depending on the location. So most of the guidelines at this point are based on uh, canine tumors. This is, uh, as, as we all know, there have been quite a few examples. There is a lot of mast cell tumors in vet medicine. This is an example of a mast cell tumor in a dog um, infiltrating in this image on the left. And then we have it here with some eosinophils infiltrating, and then here in a lymph node with some um, toluidine blue stain highlighting the, the granules in the mast cells. So um, when, when I was um, going through this um, case, um, in order to, to give some meaningful information to the clinician, I went through this paper, uh, which uh, splits a little bit the presence of um, mast cells in lymph nodes and then categorizes them in different categories from no metastasis to different stages of metastasis and based on the counts that I've done in this case it was an early metastasis. I can't, I'll come back to what HN2 means in a little bit and I'll, I'll um, talk a little bit more about the paper. The point is that mast cells live in lymph nodes. They can be there when there is a lymph, when there's a muscle tumor or when there is no muscle tumor. So they can be present for non-neoplastic reasons. At this point, there is no marker that is able to distinguish between neoplastic and non-neoplastic muscles. And when I'm thinking about this, uh, it, it, it can become a little bit problematic. So uh, I, I, invite, uh, I invite the people uh, that are attending to think about what, what is your approach? How often do you uh, stain lymph nodes when the lymph nodes are available, uh, first of all? And what is your approach to interpreting the presence of mast cells um, in, in, uh, in lymph nodes? We'll talk more about it in a little bit. Uh, other tumors that might have unique features are uh, lymphomas um, and both, and this is an example of a lymphoma. I like to call them boring round cell tumors. I'm not a lymphoma expert. I'm sure the lymphoma experts, they look at this and they'll be pinpointing and telling this is the specific subtype. Uh, that's, that's not me, I'm not there yet. So lymphomas and mast cells tumor rarely metastasize to the lung. So that's a unique feature for these tumors. On the other hand, other tumors have a predilection for bone metastasis. And um, I took some examples from the JPC website here. Carcinomas, especially, there is a, a carcinoma, mammary carcinoma illustrated on the left, pulmonary carcinoma and the prostate carcinoma. Prostate carcinoma can also um, sometimes be found as a metastasis in the lung. We'll be talking today about metastasis, so that becomes a little bit um, relevant a few slides later. Uh, also, when we're talking about limitations of the guideline, sometimes it can be really complicated to differentiate between a multicentric 
versus a metastatic tumor. And I think this is a statement that is true for both clinicians, oncologists, or pathologists. It's not always easy to determine the original site of a tumor. You're, you're sometimes thinking, you're sometimes guessing, and maybe your algorithm is right, maybe it's not. Most of the times you're, you might be looking for the largest uh, one when you're thinking it's metastatic. So examples of tumors that uh, uh, maybe um, sometimes uh, multicentric would be hemangiosarcomas. This is an example in the heart of a dog or um, disseminated histiocytic sarcomas. And just want to show an atypical mitotic figure here and a multinucleated cell over there. Now, with outcome assessment, uh, the, the goal is to determine which histological or gross parameters are clinically important, right? So um, all of our studies need to be reproducible, repeatable, and replicated with standardized parameters. And uh, that being said, for, for confirmation of a tumor or for confirmation of recurrence or for confirmation of a metastatic lesion, at this point, the gold standard is histopathology. And for histopathology, most of the time, you would need a pathologist to, to look at the slide and to confirm that. Histopathology, or it says here cytology at the minimum, but uh, we'll, we'll stick with that. Histopathology is the gold standard. And some examples of, of studies that have used the histopathology gold sand, uh, standard um, are publications that look at sentinel lymph node mapping with histopathology, uh, or when that was not available, um, local regional lymph node draining patterns. And there is also some um, published lymph node metastasis grading schemes that I will be talking to, uh, as I mentioned already. Uh, the question is, are these schemes of lymph node metastasis that were developed for mast cell tumors applicable to other tumor types? Well, uh, that is for, for us to probably find out. And for that, we need these studies that are uh, going to use standardized methods and they can be uh, replicable. I found uh, this, this, this uh, paper um, in the New England Journal of Medicine is called Machine Learning and the Cancer Diagnosis Problem. No gold standard, they call it. Um, even though they admit that microscopic examination of tissue is the gold standard at this point for cancer diagnosis and that at this point, although there are promising other techniques, they're not there yet. Maybe molecular testing and molecular um, technology will be there in the future. Um, they talk a little bit about machine learning and how beneficial or harmful that can be when we use it for cancer diagnosis. Of course, it would uh, increase the speed if optimized. It would increase uh, the consistency of diagnosis, but it may also exacerbate over diagnosis. And um, the, the, the paper, which is more like an opinion paper, um, defines how clinical interest is more of a dynamic process and the pathological interpretation, which results in the gold standard, is based on a static observation. And uh, they define the so-called gold standard problem, as, as uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Dark said it uh, earlier, you know, you put a few pathologists in the room, five pathologists, and you get six different opinion. Um, and studies have demonstrated uh, that inter-observer agreement varies among pathologies. Uh, there may be disagreement about the underlying histopathologies diagnosis, and this is documented for many tumor types. Um, pathologists can disagree, but the question is which one is correct about identifying clinically meaningful cancer. So if you want, you can have a look at the, the paper. Um, I mentioned uh, this, this paper from 2014, and this, this is the one that came out with this scheme of um, classification for lymph node metastasis uh, in mast cells tumors, right? And the HN is, is on the left-hand side here, is, is the classification uh, acronym. And then it goes from non-metastatic to overt metastasis, depending on the number of cells that they uh, demonstrated there. And um, the, the paper used uh, primary tumor, so they had, uh, uh, for samples, they had primary tumor and lymph node tissue that was uh, submitted. Now, a different paper then uh, came and um, uh, interestingly found that uh, non papable or normal size regional lymph nodes in dogs with canine mast cell tumors can harbor 
histologically detectable metastatic disease in nearly half of the cases. Um, and this was done uh, in, in mast cell tumor. What about other solid tumors? We need more studies. We need studies to look at this type of information. What would be the impact of such a finding on you know, study design, staging, outcome assessment? Um, it's essential to have long-term follow-up of our patients um, and to discuss the significance of presence of tumor cells in the lymph nodes. Maybe they're not as bad as uh, once the thought. And Dr. Mutant talked a little bit about that. Um, and he mentioned the study where um, they used lymph node uh, aspiration uh, in a number of dogs. And um, based on that study, they, they, uh, they came up with a significant difference between stage one and stage two mast cell tumor. Uh, I invite you to think about what could this or how can this information influence owner or clinician treatment decision. If you know that you have very small chance of, of treating the patient, how likely are you to invest uh, there? Um, or, you know, what would be the effects on survival data? Maybe some owners would decide that they want to euthanize. And uh, this is uh, just to illustrate that other studies with different sample size, different treatment, then reported prolonged survival times in, in dogs with stage two mast cell tumor. So we have to be careful. And uh, this is why we do need to standardize um, how we, we report the findings. You will find all of this information in um, the guideline on the website. And I just took it out from there. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh will be talking <clears throat> about uh, several uh, of these uh, different uh, key features of a study design. They are listed here a little bit more in detail than the paper in 2011, study objective, study population, reference population, sample size. Uh, these are things to keep in mind if you are planning a study. And ideally, we want to um, kind of be on the same page uh, when we're doing an oncology study. I will talk in a little bit about recurrence, and I will also be talking about metastasis as well. So um, how do we define metastasis? What is uh, regional metastasis? What is uh, distant metastasis? And how do we, most importantly, how do we uh, confirm it? So when, when you have a metastasis, if it's regional, uh, was it confirmed or was it only suspected? And it's the same for distant. Was it confirmed or was it suspected? As I talked already, the gold standard for confirmation at this point remains histology. You have to state the method in your study. If you use histology or you use cytology with histology, even better. Um, if it was suspected, you have to state the method that you use. Was it fine needle aspirate cytology? Was it imaging? What type of imaging? Um, Dr. Foster uh, gave his preferences about some type of imaging there. So it's, it's important to have all of this information clearly presented in the material uh, sections. Suspected metastatic uh, disease and or locally recurrent lesions. Sometimes lesions may be unrelated to the primary tumors, and we all know that uh, some breeds of dogs can have multiple tumors, for example, golden retriever, rottweiler, etc. This is just one example that I had was a dog that had some um, soft tissue tumor on the skin, and then it had a multiple myeloma here on the left, and then it had some testicular tumors. So it was a mess. Are you looking at the metastasis in the bone? Are you looking at the primary tumor? So sometimes it's important to have this information about the breed of the dog and to, to clearly use a, a gold standard to um, diagnose. If it's only imaging, it would be a little bit more complicated. And we do need high or higher at least autopsy rates, at least 20% in a study. And um, that would be crucial to generating some valid results confirmed by histology. We do need autopsy data. And um, although it may be sensitive, uh, autopsy should be a component of study design and it should be described in, in the patient consent forms and owners. And uh, I think clinicians play an essential role in, um, in, in informing the, the owners about the, the benefits of, uh, of, of this uh, autopsy for their dog. Local recurrence, which is uh, defined as the presence of the same tumor within the region of a previous surgical site. If you have something like that, was it confirmed or was it suspected? Confirmed with histopathology, Again, the gold standard or cytology, uh, sometimes depends on the tumor time that uh, type, it might be enough. 
or just suspect it. A local recurrence should be a single event, regardless of the number of tumors that may develop at the surgical site. And some tumor types, like soft tissue tumors or soft tissue sarcomas, um, arising at a different soft tissue site, most likely they would represent the novo tumors rather than a uh, metastatic uh, tumor. Uh, because we know, based on previous studies, majority of uh, dog soft tissue tumor of soft tissue mesenchymal sarcoma do not metastasize to regional influence to lungs or to distant uh, sites. Um, why do we need histopathology? Why is histopathology the gold standard? Uh, because tissue architecture provides more information. It's able to exclude benign masses. And in the, I will talk about some examples of differentiating between reactive fibroplasia a granuloma or, or a gossipoboma versus a tumor, and also can differentiate uh, uh, the novo, unrelated the novo tumor in the same site. And the uh, finite needle aspirate cytology, um, that technique, it's almost impossible to distinguish between granulation tissue and neoplastic spindle cells or identify the type of soft tissue tumor. Now, I have these uh, images from uh, Dr. Thrall and I talked with uh, Dr. Newton as well. They're both uh, well-known clinical pathologists. And um, these tips are really, really useful, uh, especially for people that don't do a lot of cytology. Uh, if you have a mixture of spindle cells in your cytology, and your background does not necessarily have inflammation, like the image on the left, you should go more on the side and suspect sarcoma. And if you have a mixture of inflammatory cells, we do have some neutrophils here, viable and degenerate, uh, besides the, um, the fibroblast here in the center and some red blood cells. So if you have inflammatory cells, they would think more uh, inflammatory or reactive. And this is usually based on examining multiple slides, not just one slide. Of course, in the future, uh, maybe histopathology can be um, replaced by molecular testing and genetic signature of tumor and host can also be something to look at. Soft tissue tumor versus granulation tissue. We looked at some uh, examples cytologically, and this is a histology of a dog from a skin uh, with soft tissue um, sarcoma. Cytology cannot confirm, but helps. And size is really, really important uh, when, when we're talking about differentiating a soft tissue tumor and the granulation tissue. And even though I have, I have this from Dr. Newton, the size is, is very important. What I always tell my students is that tumors always have to start small. So it depends. Even with, with the size, it depends. It depends if you're uh, getting the tumor you know, early or later uh, in the process. But as a rule of thumb, granulation tissue in dogs <laughs> is never bigger than 2.5 centimeters. Whereas as we know, horses may get this exuberant uh, granulation tissue, which is a frequent complication of wound healing by second intention. And uh, histologically, we do have a few characteristics to recognize granulation tissue, um, inf uh, has inflammatory cells, grows perpendicular to blood vessels, etc. This is another example from a case that was a hemangiopericytoma, which is common in dogs in the legs. And we have the cytology on the top and the histology on the bottom. Uh, we, we do see these few individualized, predominantly fusiform cells on histology. On, as a differential diagnosis, the clinical pathologist call it mesenchymal spindle cell tumor versus granulation tissue on cytology. That's why, again, the gold standard histopathology was able to differentiate this and come up with a different uh, definitive diagnosis. Biogranulomatous um, inflammation, or granulomatous inflammation versus histiocytic neoplasia. Um, on cytology, this type of inflammation may also be sometimes misdiagnosed as a neoplasm. As we know, histiocytes are, or macrophages are large cells. They can be multinucleated or binucleated sometimes. And one of the keys when you're assessing cytologically those slides is looking at neutrophils. If they're present, you think more biogranulomatous. And if you're thinking biogranulomatous inflammation, look for some agent or foreign material. You do need histopathology sometimes to confirm. So it's not uh, always an easy call. Uh, something that I found uh, earlier in my career, I was always trying to come up with the definitive diagnosis and sometimes I was pushing myself or forcing it and nowadays I just you know I, I, I tend to put in the limitations uh, in there and say you know suspect it off but it still can be the other thing or 
Um, recurrence and metastasis should be straightforward to a pathologist if they're using histopathology, but not always histopathology is something that is feasible, maybe financially or maybe because of the projected tumor behavior. Uh, Dr. Kavana will talk about survival time, survival intervals, etc. Pathologists are key in determining definitive recurrence or metastasis. Uh, info that is used and uh, funneled to clinicians, and they are the ones that look at the big pictures and they will determine disease-free or progression-free intervals. And just a, a reminder here, grade is something that comes from a pathologist and you'll hear clinicians talking about stages. Um, some other work in progress, uh, since I mentioned soft tissue sarcomas, you, you'll find this uh, um, the consensus on canine soft tissue sarcomas on this website there. And this group encourages uniform use of terminology, transparency in data reporting and comparisons among future studies. Um, I'm going to finish uh, with some conclusions and then let Dr. Kavana take over. Importantly is that um, we have journals on board. They are the gatekeepers, as Dr. Mutin likes to call them. And we do need standardized methods of histologic and outcome assessment parameters in order to compare studies and apply data to clinical cases. Oncology studies um, are encouraged to have a pathologist uh, in the team. And oncology studies uh, should have or are encouraged to have as many autopsies as possible, at least 20% of the cages, cases. Our group currently is working at, at some letters to some journal editors uh, where we will be suggesting some of this um, uh, to, to the journals. And um, as I've been hearing this uh, in the first webinar, in the second day webinar, clinicians and diagnosticians need to collaborate more as a multidisciplinary team, especially when results differ, to reconcile the findings and optimize delivery of patient care. I would like to thank the Davis Thompson Foundation for hosting this uh, webinar and co-sponsoring it, and also to the ACVP for co-sponsoring the webinar. And then um, my colleagues from VCGP, Dr. Mutin, Dr. Williams, uh, Tarin, um, Dr. Moore, Christoph, uh, Michael, and, and Milan. Thank you for, for all your help. Thank you for allowing me to, to present uh, this information and um, sign up, spread the word, and I will give it over to Dr. Kavano. All right, just trying to <clears throat> share my screen here. Pompey, are you still sharing? No. Okay. You should be able to. Do you want me to 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 share uh, the presentation? From um. I guess it would be easier if I could do it. I'm getting like an open signal. Yeah, I guess we can just go ahead and do it that way. Okay, I, I, I'll try and share it. It's uh, the one that we have online, right? Yeah, I did make some modifications. Um, We're good, Ryan? Yeah, let me just try one other thing um, just to allow the security. 
with Zoom. Okay. All right, yeah, go ahead. All right, I'm also just gonna kind of hop off video um, just to uh, free up some bandwidth. Um, so my name's um, Ryan Cavanaugh. Um, I went to Colorado State University and then I did my um, postgraduate training at the Animal Medical Center. So a rotating internship and surgical residency. And thereafter, um, I was kind of the inaugural fellow at uh, the University of Florida. Um, so I did my surgical oncology fellowship there. And then afterward, they spent a little over 10 years in um, private um, specialty practice, uh, kind of grinding away. And then over the past four years, I've been here at Ross, um, and I currently am an associate professor um, teaching both um, in medicine and surgery, giving some of the oncology lectures, as well as a lot of the um, soft tissue surgery heavy lectures. Um, so go to the next slide. So um, just to kind of set the stage for the content of my presentation, I'll start by reiter reiterating what um, Pompey highlighted in his talk regarding some of the concerns or issues with the current state of outcome assessment in our profession. Um, so we know that it's required, um, but unfortunately the clinical outcome measures are not universally standardized and confounders exist. The next slide. So to, to um, kind of highlight some of the confounders that um, we typically encounter in the clinic, um, I'll talk about uh, median survival time. So here we have an example of two dogs, um, same age, same sex, same breed. Um, in fact, they have the same lesion. Um, so an osteolytic, osteoblastic lesion of the distal radial metaphysis. And um, the presumptive diagnosis is osteosarcoma. So clinically, both of these dogs are staged with the minimum database. We look at alkaline phosphatase as um, uh, a potential negative prognostic indicator. And in these dogs, it was found to be normal. Um, both of them have a thoracic metastasis check, um, a technetium bone scan, um, all of which showed no evidence of macroscopically detectable metastatic disease. So both of these dogs then undergo curative intent treatment. Um, they have a local control via four-quarter amputation, followed by adjunctive therapy um, in the form of carboplatin times four. And they both then have essentially the same uh, clinical outcome. So 10 months postoperatively, um, they develop um, presumed metastasis to the right femur. Um, the animals both present with a, a mild lameness and radiographs of that region are taken and, and we see um, you know, sort of a multifocal osteolysis of the femoral diaphysis and then radiographs are taken and, and we see uh, multifocal soft tissue nodules of the lungs. So um, from a clinical outcome standpoint, um, dog A is euthanized 10.5 uh, months post-op and dog B is euthanized 15.5 uh, months post-op. So we'll go to the next slide and kind of look at this further. So, um, you know, dog A is, is euthanized a couple weeks after the presumed metastasis is documented um, because the um, owners, although the dog's quality of life is good after discussing, discussing the case with the clinician, um, once the animal became progressively lame in that right pelvic limb, um, they wanted to intervene before, you know, kind of things got worse. They wanted to avoid traversing the slippery slope of, um, you know, kind of seeing the animal deteriorate before them. Whereas um, dog B, um, despite the dog suffering a very poor quality of life, the owners did not intervene until um, pathologic fracture of the right pelvic limb, um, you know, was, was documented. Um, so both dogs are um, euthanized without um, any uh, post-mortem evaluation. And then this data is kind of dredged um, in preparation to put together um, a clinical retrospective study um, to produce the median survival time. And so, you know, the, the outcomes in studies of companion animal cancer are, are really strongly influenced by the values of pet owners and, and their financial capabilities. 
And the outcomes in many of these studies uh, are unclear as to the causes of death, and many of them are not confirmed by necropsy. So this example just really highlights, um, you know, sort of what we have to navigate as, as we try and use the literature um, to counsel clients about expectations for, for how um, their dogs are going to do. So really the answer is, you know, how do we use that data? Um, so to kind of define the problem, I thought I would um, present some literature, um, really some, some good literature, um, but um, still, you know, kind of has uh, flaws that can contribute to some of the problems that we have in terms of outcome assessment. So in this particular paper <clears throat> published in JABMA in 2011, it was a multi-institutional retrospective study. Cases were accrued from um, both Wisconsin and OBC. Um, and they enrolled 65 dogs with appendicular osteosarcoma, so um, a relatively uh, homogenous um, kind of population of animals. Um, all the dogs were considered to have stage 2B disease, meaning that they were high-grade tumors without metastasis, um, the B indicating that they were intramedullary lesions with local extramedullary spread, so kind of prototypical um, osteosarcoma as it presents to us clinically. They, they all kind of had comprehensive workup and staging, which was shown to be negative. They all had curative intent surgical treatment. So very standardized regimens for the most part. And um, the, the, the cases were um, kind of um, put through the modified Kirpenstein system in terms of the histologic review and grading um, as part of this study. So the objectives of the study um, were to uh, determine the outcome associated with adjuvant carboplatin treatment, examine the usefulness of preoperative biopsy, and really to determine if a modified grading system predicts uh, survival. So um, the outcome was that carboplatin was uh, effective as other published chemotherapy protocols, which, which is important um, because um, a multitude of studies have been done trying to you know, find um, a better you know, cytotoxic chemotherapeutic regimen. And ultimately, this kind of allowed us to settle on um, a regimen that is well-tolerated, affordable, um, with a you know, low side effect profile. The median survival time and disease-free interval um, identified in the study was consistent with um, previous publications evaluating survival time in the literature for osteosarcoma. Uh, it was a good study in that it had long-term follow-up, so the one, two, and three-year survival rates were um, on par with what had previously been published. And what they did find is that um, grade vascular invasion, the mitotic index as dictated by greater than five um, mitoses in three high-powered fields, were neg negatively um, correlated with survival. So they um, summarized by saying that the modified grading system did in fact uh, predict survival. And now most practitioners will evaluate these data and kind of take them as truth without putting much thought into the uh, quality of the study's methodologies. And <clears throat> again, it's not that the study was bad, but some of the issues and confounders that we can identify to help us see where we can potentially um, do better as we go to standardize things. Um, you know, this is pretty typical for a lot of the retrospective studies that we do. So there was no control for negative prognostic variables. Um, so a fair percentage of the cases um, were proximal humeral tumors. And we know that that particular location is correlated with a more aggressive um, tumor variant. So um, in fact, there, there was a little bit of heterogeneity in the, in the clinical population, even though um, for the most part, they tried to control for that. Um, only about 58% of the tumors were available for grading and review by a single pathologist. Um, in terms of follow-up, there was, there was no established protocol um, and the follow-up was inconsistent. And although um, a fairly high percentage had um, three view thoracic radiographs um, at a median of you know 103 days post-op there wasn't really a lot of follow-up thereafter and then looking at metastasis um, that that was documented um, in a fairly high percentage of the dogs within 120 days post-op um, this um, is related to lead time bias because most of these animals you know were finishing up their chemotherapy protocol and were restaged during that time um, but no dog had um, anti-mortem uh, anti confirmation of METs via necropsy. Um, and so, you know, we just don't know if they truly had metastatic disease or some other neoplastic process. 
And then finally, um, some of the dogs went on and had treatment after metastatic disease, so 17% of them, and um, those particular treatments were not standardized. So we've got a really good study, but still, you know, lots of potential confounders that could complicate, um, you know, sort of our outcome assessments. And, you know, in studies evaluating osteosarcoma, a common clinical trend has been identified, which suggests that 20% of dogs receiving adequate local control and systemic control, they will die of their disease within about 140 days post-op. And also 20% of dogs receiving adequate local control and systemic control will live um, for two years post-op. So um, go ahead, Pompey. You know, the, the real question then is what is causing these divergent results? And is the grading system, you know, truly predictive of outcome in these cases? Go ahead. And so I think that um, probably spawned um, the inception of, of this study, uh, taking a, a closer look at a cohort of dogs with osteosarcoma. So uh, again, these animals were, pull, were pulled from the OVC um, from the late 1990s into 2014. They took 85 dogs with appendicular osteosarcoma. Again, a relatively homogenous cohort of animals. Um, none of the animals um, were identified to have metastasis with comprehensive um, pretreatment screening. All of them received curative intent therapy with um, local control via amputation and um, cytotoxic chemotherapy. They had three evaluators um, who compared two histologic grading systems. And ultimately, um, their objective was to determine if there's prog prognostic value to these systems. In other words, they were, were wondering, does grade correlate with median survival time and disease-free interval? Um, and I think it's, it's worth noting um, that there are at least nine different studies evaluating the prognostic value of individual histologic features um, and you know, of the proposed grading systems. And the results have, have really varied quite widely. So, um, you know, as, as we work in the clinic, as you guys work under the microscope, it's sort of hard to know, um, you know, which, which system to follow. And so for um, this paper, they, they use the Kirpenstein system and the Loki Polos and Robinson um, grading system. And essentially how it worked is that each of the evaluating pathologists was provided a copy of both published studies describing the, the respective grading systems um, as the only form of guidance to assign uh, histologic grades. And they weren't allowed to kind of discuss uh, the systems amongst each other as they prepared to you know, kind of um, you know, produce their results. And essentially um, what they found is that all three evaluators uh, were only able to agree on the histologic subtype less than 67% of the time. Um, very poor um, levels of uh, agreement in terms of the uh, pleomorphism that's present. Um, if you see the agreement between the grades, um, the lower the grade, the, the harder it was to have, um, you know, kind of agreement between a grade assignment as as the tumors got more aggressive, um, as is relatively typical um, with these studies, it was easier for the pathologist to kind of come to terms using both of the systems. Uh, the DFI and survival time were also kind of in line with um, the historic um, osteosarcoma studies that have been published. And the number of mitoses per three high power field was the only significant factor for median survival time as described by um, only one of the, the pathologists um, contributing to the study. And ultimately, um, they determined that grade was not predictive of median survival time or disease free interval in, in either one of the systems. So despite being around for uh, 16 and 11 years, respectively, from the time when this paper was published, you know, it's determined that neither system was suitable for widespread application. And the authors um, kind of support the notion that greater than one evaluator and study population is really desired for the development of these histologic grading schemes. The value of the, the histologic grading as a routine test for prognostication of osteosarcoma was called into question. And they, you know, they called for clearly outlined, well-defined histological review process that allows reproducible categorization um, in order to provide meaningful prognostic um, and therapeutic guidance to clinicians and owners. 
But um, this is not just a pathologist problem. Um, if you kind of look at the discussion and, and really interpret it, um, the endpoints in the study were determined over 17 years with multiple clinicians and diagnosticians and caregivers involved. Um, there was massive evolution of, of technology during that period. And so did the variability in treatment and outcome assessments contribute to weak, the weak predictability of the grading systems? And in the same volume of uh, veterinary pathology um, that uh, the SHOT study was published, Dr. Mutin and, and company um, used the opportunity to, to leverage a call to arms for the formulation of standards for tumor evaluation in, in veterinary oncology. And they suggested, as, as Pompey mentioned, a checklist of evaluated parameters to be used um, by investigators, which is back checked during publication processes. And you know, also kind of have, have defined standards with the, the histologic features, the ancillary tools, and the outcome assessments, um, including um, you know, sort of detailed explanation of, of set assessments. And that really kind of leads itself you know, to, um, to, to why we're here today. Um, it ties in nicely with the objectives of the um, VCGP. Um, and um, I thought it was just kind of a nice lead into, um, you know, kind of uh, to kind of set the stage for the delivery of the talk. Um, and the, the, govern, the governing document developed by the American College of Veterinary Pathologists Oncology Committee was, was already in place to support these recommendations and it had been so um, for a good seven years. So when Pompey um, asked me to participate in this talk to provide a clinical perspective on the status and achievability of outcome assessment standardization as suggested, by the VCGP guidelines. Um, so really the, the following slides are kind of my take um, on, on things. Um, and I'm not gonna read each of these to you. I'll kind of work through them as, as we make our way through. So, um, you know, when Pompe when Pompey and I were kind of talking about uh, what we wanted to cover, um, one of the, the things that um, both of us kind of came up with is the importance of communication um, between the clinical team and between the pathologists. Um, and uh, I thought I could use uh, this particular manuscript to kind of highlight um, the, the importance of that. So this study was published last year in Veterinary Comparative and Oncology. Um, and uh, the aim of the study was to evaluate the therapeutic benefit of adjuvant medical treatment, post-surgical excision of primary low-grade mast cell tumors, patinic grade one and two and cupel low grades, um, and lymphadenectomy of HN2 or early metastatic nodes as Pompey kind of reviewed that system. Um, and so, you know, early lymph node metastasis, when we get that diagnosis from the pathologist, that's a little bit hard to handle from a therapeutic standpoint, it's, it's, I guess I kind of equate it similar to the patinic grade two variants that used to kind of be pumped out regularly um, when, you know, when we were using that system um, more commonly. And you know, we know that overt lymph node metastasis is a negative prognostic indicator in dogs with mast cell tumors. And while elective lymphadenectomy of, of metastatic, fulminantly metastatic lymph nodes improves outcome, you know, the benefit of adjunctive medical therapy in dogs with this early metastatic disease is, is debated. And so this study was designed to kind of help us. So they had 73 dogs, 42 that received um, chemotherapy uh, after surgery and 31 dogs that did not. Um, and really, you know, in short, what they found is that um, the time to progression was significantly shorter in dogs that received the adjuvant medical treatment. And there was a si si similar tendency uh, trend for overall survival. So that's the opposite of what you would expect. And so um, a, a lot of times, you know, when we get our pathology report, um, you guys will include a prognostic blur based on the literature. And so, you know, taking this, for example, a 2020 study showed that dogs with surgically excised low-grade mast cell tumors and elective lymphadenectomy of the HN2 regional lymph nodes have a good prognosis and the use of adjuvant medical treatment in these dogs as dictated by that study does not seem to provide any benefit in terms of progression and survival. And, you know, talking to students, um, going through interpretation of um, biopsies and, you know, working with um, general practitioners and referral practice, um, you know, many clinicians kind of take what's written there as, as gospel, 
But the, the question is, you know, what if, what if the clinician didn't tell the pathologist that those were not sentinel lymph nodes that were submitted? Um, and so without that knowledge, the uh, above recommendation, you know, could potentially be made within a vacuum. Um, understanding that nodes are, are not sentinel, you know, we know that we are missing important prognostic inf information in, uh, up to 40% of the time. Um, but not knowing the status of where the nodes come from creates even more confusion. And so one of the, the things that I, I see when I look at this uh, study and, and it kind of reverts back to communication with pathologists is, is that um, more dogs in the no treatment group had their sentinel lymph nodes assessed. Um, so we feel better that their nodes were truly representative of early metastasis, but in the treatment group, 90% um, of the nodes were not sentinel um, and they may have been downstream nodes and the sentinel node contained fulminant metastasis, um, which is what influenced, you know, sort of the, their outcome metrics in the study. Those dogs did worse. Um, so, you know, it just goes to show, I mean, how often do you guys get um, the status of the lymph nodes when you have a, you know, skin tumor excise with a concomitant lymph node sample, how often, you know, is the clinician indicating these are sentinel lymph nodes versus not? So just kind of highlighting communication there. We'll go to the next slide. And another kind of classic example of where communication is critical between the clinician and, and the pathologist is, um, you know, the biologically high grade, histologically low grade um, fibrosarcoma variants in, in the oral cavity. Um, so here we have a three and a half year old male neutered golden with, with an oral mass, dog presents for halitosis um, to their general practitioner, um, their family veterinarian. Um, the veterinarian sets up a dental cleaning. Um, and at the time of uh, the dental, they, they, they identify the mass, they perform an excisional biopsy. Um, and then, you know, they submit uh, the, the tumor with, with minimal clinical history. So um, how often do you guys get um, a biopsy requisition form that just says mass on it or tumor? And so, you know, like, um, you know, like Milan said, garbage in, garbage out. And so you're forced to make a diagnosis based on what you see. And so it's called a fibroma. And, and then um, that's returned to the clinician and no further treatment is recommended. Um, and many clinicians are, are complacent with um, their, their pathology requisitions. And, you know, I suggest kind of a standardized form that a clinician must complete um, or the, the histo is not analyzed, you know, almost like a synoptic uh, requisition form where, you know, you force us to put certain things on, on the requisition to help you ultimately help us and, and the client. So circa uh, 2011, the um, ACVP Oncology Committee emphasized a few considerations uh, in the assessment of clinical outcomes section of their manuscript. And so they, they say ideally lymph node status should be determined by histologic or minimally cytologic evaluation. However, this is not always possible as the case of internal node management. And it goes on to say in human medicine, um, sentinel lymph node examination is the ideal method to properly evaluate tributary lymph nodes. Unfortunately, this methodology has not not been routinely established in veterinary medicine. And so interestingly, kind of since that time, there's, there's been a pretty rapid evolution um, on the clinical side of things, particularly on the surgical side of things, um, with regard to um, the technology for reporting sentinel lymph node mapping. Um, so there was kind of early reports in the 2000s and, and then, you know, kind of um, starting um, 2000, you know, 12, 13, and then on um, a bunch of different um, studies have been done looking at um, direct and indirect methods of mapping the sentinel lymph node um, and looking at all sorts of different methods for doing that, whether it be a lipid or white water soluble contrast agent. Um, using um, plain radiography or CT or, or even um, more sophisticated methods of doing that. And again, I, I mentioned this in one of the previous slides, but just to, to kind of highlight, based on the early work uh, done by Deanna Worley at CSU, um, looking at mast cell tumors and, and the sentinel lymph nodes, um, she showed um, that the lymph node draining the tumor was not the regional lymph node in, in over 40% of cases. So, um, you know, this, this kind of needs to be standardized um, in our profession in order to really optimize sample collection and, and really help us um, with, with our outcome assessments. And one of the techniques that I'll highlight here in the images 
um, is something that I think can be done in general practice, because I really feel like if we're going to make um, headway here, we need to involve all of those individuals performing mass excisions. And that's potentially, you know, 80% of the samples that are coming through to you guys. Um, I don't think it's going to be enough if just the specialists are, you know, submitting their, their sentinel lymph nodes. Um, we need to have everyone kind of buy in. And, and really the biggest problem is going to be getting this done in general practice. So this technique um, described by Brissett and kind of coined by um, Julius Liptak involves injection of um, a lipid soluble contrast agent around the tumor. Um, it's it's um, uh, relatively easy to come by. Um, it's from poppy seed oil and um, you inject it around the tumor. You bring the animal in 24 hours later, usually on the day of surgery and um, you take regional orthogonal radiographs and, and the node that's highlighted um, should be the sentinel lymph node. And then um, at the time of surgery, you'll go ahead and, and extirpate that, that lymph node um, with or without the assistance of um, you know, a dye injected again around the tumor at the time of surgery. And one of the more recent studies that kind of validated the reason why the ACVP Oncology Committee in their 2011 publication um, stressed the importance of utilizing sentinel lymph node mapping um, for reporting in prognostic studies um, is really demonstrated um, you know, here on, on this slide. So this study was just published in veterinary surgery. So many of you may not be familiar with it. Um, came, came out of Cornell. Um, and essentially um, what they did is they looked at 17 dogs that had 20 different cutaneous mast cell tumors. And in those dogs, they performed regional lymph node aspirates um, and then did sentinel lymph node mapping after the fact, um, corresponding you know, with, with the primary tumor. And they compared the results of the regional lymph node cytology and the sentinel lymph node histology to see the impact on clinical stage assignment and adjunctive treatment recommendations. And so the sentinel lymph node, not surprisingly, differed from the anatomic or local regional lymph node in 28% of cases. Um, there was histologically confirmed metastases in 45% of the sentinel lymph nodes, and in only one of the 20 samples um, from the FNA from the anatomical lymph node. And only 32% of the FNA samples were, were diagnostic. So just really stressing the point that Pompey made that, you know, that histology is key and, and it really goes beyond histology. It needs to be um, histology of the sentinel lymph node. And you know, here's um, the, the real take home message is that the results of the sentinel lymph node would have changed the stage and the adjunctive treatment recommendations in 40% of cases. So we as clinicians really need to um, you know, kind of move forward with this, and, and we are. Um, it's critical to give pathologists, um, you know, kind of the, the information that that's what's been done. We've mapped the nodes, we've removed them, and, and that's what we're providing you with so that um, you can use that information to, you know, sort of optimize your reporting. Um, we, we're making headway, so just a quick Google Scholar search showed that, um, you know, got over 1,400 hits, um, so there's lots of work being um, being done on this. And then ultimately, um, as I said, I feel like this needs to be assimilated uh, into general practice and established as the standard of care for solid tumor management. And my thought would be to try to have the general practitioners do indirect lymphography techniques using the readily available, pretty simplistic lipid soluble contrast agent techniques um, with, um, with regional radiography um, based on its widespread availability. All right, so just a little bit more um, on RESIST. I know um, Pompey covered this a little bit. So um, these guidelines were developed in conjunction with the World Health Organization, um, really to avoid arbitrary decisions in, in assessing therapeutic response. Um, so the, the RESIST model is meant to be easy to use, repeatable and applicable across you know, a variety of clinical trials, as, as Pompey mentioned. And so kind of started in 2000, um, it was meant to be a living document. Um, it changed in 2009 in people. We adopted it for lymphoma in 2010 and then for solid tumors in 2015. For those of you that, that aren't familiar with it, so um, we use kind of four uh, 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 overall assessments. So um, complete response where the tumor um, is gone. Um, a partial response where you see greater than or equal to a 30% decrease in the, the tumor or the lymph node if you're managing lymphoma, progressive disease where you have greater than or equal to 20% increase in the tumor or the lymph node, and then stable disease 
um, where you basically kind of have the percent difference between negative 30% and positive 20%. Um, the one thing that I think we need to pay attention to as, as we're still sort of embracing this globally in our profession is that in the human sector, this has evolved um, to not just use morphologic criteria. So the original resist, resist system was based on the, the visible, palpable, measurable size of the tumor in its longest dimension. Um, and now they're using metabolic, um, you know, kind of assessment um, to determine response and there are new studies kind of showing discordance between these systems with um, greater accuracy of response with metabolic assessment. So although we are using PET-CT, um, it's mainly in academia and it's mainly just to, to get the foundational studies kind of performed um, and we still have a long, a long way to go. Okay, um, so this is where my presentation kind of differed a little bit um, than probably the one that, that you have, Pompeii. So um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure kind of what, what changed, but I'll kind of, I'll run with it. So we, we are on time uh, actually, Ryan. So um, you, you just tell me what you want. To, should I go with the next slide? No, no, we'll, we can kind of stay put there. Um, that, that's fine. So, you know, Ultimately, I, I had a slide where I kind of talked about, um, you know, outcome terminology and um, basically, you know, it's not particularly standardized in, in veterinary medicine, but it really should be in order to make the best use of the rhesus data. So in people, um, you know, they, they, they report the five-year survival rate. Um, and, you know, we don't really use that in, in our profession because pets oftentimes don't live that long or have that long of follow-up in the studies. And the five-year survival rate includes those in remission or still receiving treatment. So um, potentially a, a, a more specific way of, of you know, assessing outcome would be to use disease-free interval and progression-free survival, which are reported in a number of studies, but not, not consistently. And so for disease-free survival, that's really defined as the, the percent in complete remission after finishing treatment. And the key is after treatment and with progression-free survival, that's the percent who did not have new tumor growth or spread during or after treatment. So with progression-free survival, um, the disease may have responded completely partially or maybe stable in line with the resist criteria, but it means that the cancer is still there and it's not growing or spreading. Um, we, on the other hand, still really lean on median survival time. Um, and, you know, despite its susceptibility to owner dictated variables, which, you know, are really hard to ascribe to a population um, as a whole. So how do we improve the reliability of survival time? Um, it's not, it's probably not going to go away. And to me, um, you know, early detection is, is key. So in, in, in our studies, quantification, our clinical studies, quantification of median survival time is, is really started at the time of treatment, usually at the time of surgery in, in many of the studies, at least kind of in, in my wheelhouse. Um, and, you know, many clients delay consultation for oftentimes extended periods of time after symptoms begin, you know, they're, they're in denial or it's not convenient. Um, and the incidence of, of microscopic metastasis at diagnosis is really high in, in many companion animal tumors. So to me, the key um, to improving survival time is to diagnose and get these, these patients undergoing treatment prior to metastasis, ideally prior to, you know, to microscopic metastasis, metastasis if possible. So again, early detection. And you know, we as clinicians really struggle to achieve um, client compliance with follow-up, um, especially if the animal is doing well, and especially if the client has to pay for testing, um, or in situations where you know a tissue biopsy is required to confirm recurrence or metastasis. So, um, to me, these are inhibitors to the use of histology, and you know, it, there's no question that that is the gold standard. That's what we're shooting for. And as I kind of mold over you know, the, the, this presentation, putting things together. Um, I, I look desperately for a silver bullet to find a way to make that happen more regularly, but I, I couldn't find it. And so ultimately I started thinking, well, you know, is it, is it time for a paradigm shift? And, um, you know, one consideration is the use of non-invasive blood-based genomic profiling, i.e. liquid biopsy. Um, so, you know, is it, is it feasible? Go ahead. Uh, time is actually up, uh, Ryan. We are uh, four minutes over. Okay. That's fine. Uh, 
we we can maybe uh, talk a little bit more in the in the panel uh, discussion uh, after after the next presentation. Yeah, 